Okay, so uh, <clears throat> today we'll talk about two architects, uh, Hans Hollein, um, happy birthday to you, sir, and uh, Lloyd Wright. Actually, uh, I, I'm a little bit confused because they are not both born on the 30th. One is born on the 31st, and I made a mistake. I mean, I have his name. I think, uh, I think either, well, I don't know. Either Hans Hollein was born on the 31st of March, not on the 30th, or uh, Lloyd Wright. One of them. I discovered this just before I began. I began. Uh, I, I started the Zoom, but it's not. I don't think it's a big. Uh, it's a big crime. Because tomorrow, anyway, it's a day Zaha Hadid, and I simply cannot uh, uh, find room for uh, anyone else near her unless that someone else is Lina Bobardi. But Lina Bobardi uh, is not born, was not born on the 30th uh, or on the 31st of March. So Hans Hollein, 1934, 2014. Uh, Hans Hollein, yeah, he was born uh, today. So it means um, um, Lloyd Wright was born on the 31st. Was an Austrian architect, Hans Hollein, and designer and key figure of postmodern architecture. Some of his most notable works are the Haas House and the Albertina Extension in the inner city of Vienna. I don't know. I mean, yes, there are so-called postmodern elements in his architecture, but I think he transcends postmodernism. Here, here he was. Um, well, I, I, I obviously have deficiencies in my uh, in my knowledge system, but I think he received the Pritzker Prize, didn't he? Anyway, it it, it, it doesn't matter so much, but uh, I think he did. Uh, you can tell on his face, actually, his face does, does, does say something about his architecture. Uh, if you look at it and if you could decipher his uh, uh, facial, uh, facial mask, if it is a, a, a facial mask. I particularly like this picture of him, you know, uh, a little younger, and, uh, but, but his face, his facial expression says a lot in my opinion. His architecture is exactly like his facial expression in this, um, in, this, uh, in this picture. An interesting and complex man. And here he is in an older age. I understood he suffered a number of years before he died. He was ill, uh, severely ill, but um, a, a force, a force in the, in the Austrian uh, architecture. Uh, field, uh, no, not only Austria, Austria being, uh, uh, despite the fact that it is uh, its population half the size of uh, the population of Romania, uh, the architecture and art is, uh, is very, very accomplished. Drawing, some drawings by Hans Hollein. Uh, he, he did drawings, uh, some of them of a highly uh, poetical or uh, visionary nature. Um, he drew well uh, manually. He, I don't think he, he employed the computer. Uh, some of his works, in my opinion, do have a, um, a twisting, of a, kind of a humorous uh, stance, um, but, but not all of them. And so he, he's truly an architect difficult to, to um, pin down, so to speak. I mean, you look, you look at this drawing, it's a sculpture, but maybe he did it for a building. It's possible. He was very, very explorative. And uh, as such, I think he was an inspiration and is an inspiration. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he, even this kind of, of drawing, it shows his artistic ability. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, he's very, very diverse um, interests. Austrians in general are interesting because I think uh, it's not an accident that uh, psycho psychoanalysis was born there or in Vienna. It, I think it, it is a country uh, of uh, contradictions and even conflicts and uh, uh, inner conflicts, that is. And, and, and those are very uh, productive for uh, creativity.
Okay, now we begin with this candle shop, a candle shop from 1964-1965 in Vienna, this uh, incredible city, which can be very conformist, but also very non-conformist. Uh, it's, it's a famous, uh, it's a famous uh, work which was published, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s uh, in all architecture magazines. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, exquisite. You know, it's like a jewel store, you know, and uh, he has, a, you will see another jewel store. You know, if you look on the left and you look on the right, this facade, you know, has something enigmatic and it's certainly uh, individualized by uh, a, a concern with, uh, with design. He was a designer, he was an architect, he was a designer, he was an architect, he was both. He designed everything, you know. So in this, you can see his um, aptitude towards, towards design. That's how he began with small works, but he arrived later at, at larger works uh, since uh, he was uh, successful. And, uh, you know, this is a, a, a great uh, opportunity for young architects. You know, you just uh, remodel a small uh, store uh, well, you know, I'm sure it's not so easy to find a job with, uh, you know, high, uh, uh, you know, uh, financial uh, power. But, you know, even with smaller means, uh, I think uh, a lot can be done. The idea is to be creative. And he was creative and he made the uh, noise, so to speak, with his creativity. Here it is uh, an, um, a drawing he made with the facade of this, um, this building. Um, yes, it was an architecture, uh, you know, I don't know if he did his drawing in the 60s, when, when he was, uh, you know, uh, when he built it, I mean, in the 60s, uh, I don't know, but who cares? We go now to New York from Austria, from Vienna, we go to New York and uh, here it is, uh, an art gallery. I don't know, I mean, you know, it seems he had success rather quickly because he arrived at maybe that person, and I think this is the case, uh, was Austria, you know, Feigen. And, uh, you know, commission Hans Hollein. But why did he commission Hans Hollein and not another architect? Because if you are creative, if you are even idiosyncratic, you, you, are, you are intense, you, are, you, are, you bring something new, of course you... you, 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 you you provoke uh, others to, to look with interest towards your work. That's why he was invited. But if you do a work which is not identifiable easy, easily, a work which is, doesn't have personality, which doesn't bring anything new, don't expect people to search for your name and to contact you because it will not happen. That's why I keep telling the students and the arca, young architects and even to those who are not young any longer, create, you know, uh, truly creative works, then, you know, uh, uh, clients might come in, but you have to bring in something new. Otherwise, why would they come to you? I think anyone who wants to pay for a building wants something different, wants something special, even those with low budgets. Why would one invest in a mediocre work, in a work which is uh, not saying anything? Why? I think even those less ambitious do want something special for the money they spend. That's what I think. It's normal. So here it is, uh, the building in New York City, where Hans Hollein had the chance to create, um, you know, uh, remodel uh, an art gallery, uh, and uh, he did. It's very important because if you have commissions, you know, here he had a commission in Vienna, a commission in New York, all of a sudden, of course, he, uh, you know, he uh, made waves, so to speak, and became known. <clears throat> and this is, <clears throat> this is how you build a reputation. Now, of course, from building a reputation and keeping it uh, is a long distance sometimes. You have to be careful not to destroy what you what you built. But look at the look at the entrance into the building. This also is like his face; is a little bit enigmatic. 
it's symmetrical and it's not symmetrical. It's a broken symmetry. And uh, here already, you know, we have a, a glimpse at what uh, Hans Holwein was about. Uh, scenes from the, you know, the opening, I guess, uh, uh, is this Sandy Warhol? I don't see very well with my glasses, but whatever. <clears throat> it's uh, the commotion of the high uh, life of uh, New York City. Now, 1974, 72, 74, this is a very important work, little work, but very important in terms of quality. And architecture is about quality, it's not about quantity. Well, you know, maybe ideally it should be about quality and quantity, but mainly it's about quality, not quantity. And this is a little work, a little shop, a jewelry shop right in the center of Vienna, but look at it. <laughs> Now, of course, the rationalists would protest. What is this nonsense here? Why did he do this? And why didn't he do it the other way? Could you please tell us, Mr. Hans Holine, why didn't you do it? Why did first, why didn't you use the why didn't you use the T square and the rectangle? What is this nonsense here? <laughs> But you know, Hans Holine would probably smile enigmatically and say, who knows what? I can, I have my own interpretation. Art and architecture also has, have subjectivity. Uh, also has, you know, it, it, this, this um, um, you know, break into the facade, this um, wound of the facade in a way. Who knows, it could symbolize many things. It also functions for these pipes, which are also um, considered sculpturally. So he, he used uh, uh, you know, a, a technical uh, element of the building to enhance the sculpturalness and the, the artistic quality of, of, of the building. And you know, I mean, look at the door, look at this, I think it's beautiful. And again and again, it's about expressing emotions, expressing art, expressing inventiveness, expressing creativity, being even a little bit crazy. You know, it's good to be crazy. That's why I keep telling the students here, be pocatos. Yes, yes, uh, do a sinful architecture. Don't be, you know, well-behaved and all that nonsense. You know, all the great creators were actually sinners all of them in the field of architecture. Uh, and some of them, and maybe many of them, even outside of architecture. And look at what this man did here. I think it's beautiful again. And it's beautiful, you know, 50 years, half a century later. Now, if some people call it uh, postmodern, they could. I wouldn't call it postmodern, no, it's, you know, it's a small space. Look at this. You know, this is a chair. I mean, you can imagine. I don't know if there are uh, dimensions here, but it's a very, I mean, look, this is the entrance door. So it's less than three doors wide, the shop. But this is one of the best uh, known works, architectural works uh, in the 70s uh, in Europe and worldwide. Uh, look at the section. Is this a big uh, volume? No, I mean, look, this is two meters and 11. I mean, it's very tiny, but qu qualitatively it's not tiny at all. It is indeed a jewel. It's a jewel box for a jewelry, for a jewelry store. And it's, uh, it's exquisite, like a jewel has to be. And indeed, as John Ruskin said, the most beautiful things in life are those which are uh, the most useless, like the, the peacock's tail and the, and the lily. You know, like this thing, this is the, the least, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, 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 yes, it, you could force some function, I guess, you know, but for the pipes, but, all in all, it's capricious. It's, it's, it has to do with aesthetics and it has to do with the sensitivity and the mood of the architect when he began to draw on the paper. The interior, well, what can we say? It's a very small space, but uh, 
again, you don't need a big space to, to make a statement, to make a splash. And this is the, the, the door. <laughs> you know, again, the, the, the common architect who might not deserve the name architect uh, or the title uh, would, would say why, uh, what, what kind of a door this is, you know, why, why is it this way? <laughs> anyway, a museum, 1972-1982, all of a sudden large spaces, a big vista, landscape and all the rest. Is this a postmodern? I think it has maybe very, very slight elements of postmodernism, but I think it transcends the, the limits of what we call postmodernism. It's a very fine museum by Hans Hollein. And uh, I hope I have better pictures, but um, I'm not very happy with them. The, the, the plan has, uh, I, I've heard the, if you ask, if, if you are so kind, please turn off the microphone unless you want to say something. Thank you. So you look at the plan, there are elements of organization, of strict organization, but there are also elements of a certain freedom. freedom. Uh, so it's order and disorder, talking about the conjunctio oppositorum, which the, uh, the, the, the Viennese, the Austrians seem to know something about and good for them. I, it, it's an excellent architecture, exactly because it escapes, you know, the, the, the easily decipherable stylistic elements. You know, it, it's, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't call it uh, uh, postmodern, no, no. Unfortun unfortunately, though, uh, what he built uh, across the Piazza Plaza from uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral, that building, yes, as elements of what we call postmodernism, but a little bit less here or almost not at all here. He was a sophisticated European architect who understood that he cannot just, uh, you know, uh, use uh, Doric columns and all the rest, although we know that Adolf Loos used the model of a Doric column for the famous um, competition in Chicago for the Chicago Tribune Tower, which became in the hands of um, Adolf Loos, a Dory column. And by the way of this, I, I will soon invite you because I want to launch a competition. This year, there are 100 years. So it's the centennial, the centennial of the that very famous, truly very famous and deservedly so, uh, international competition for the Chicago Tri Tribune Tower. It happened in 1922 and now it's 2022, exactly 100 years later. Uh, at that time, very important architects uh, participated. Uh, the competition was uh, won uh, by uh, Raymond uh, Hood and his partner. I, I will never memorize his name, but uh, that's not a crime because the work was actually done by uh, the young, unknown Raymond Hood, um, and uh, they built the, the tower. But uh, there were the great works by El Eliel Sarinen, by uh, uh, Bruno Taut, uh, Max Taut, uh, Walter Gropius. Everybody participated in that competition. And I want to launch now, by the way, of the centennial another competition, maybe called A Tower for Cities and Kane. I wrote already the text because I think we live in a di very different time. Uh, you know, a skyscraper, it's very easy to build these days. There are so many skyscrapers, taller and tall, taller, more and more extravagant. World Trade Center, then uh, the Arab world, the China. Hey, you know, a skyscraper is not a a mystery any longer, it's not a surprise any longer. The world has lots of skyscrapers. But I think we need a different kind of verticality because 
we, we cannot go on like this to build taller and taller and to consume the resources of the earth and so on. But maybe we need um, um, moral verticality or emotional verticality, or maybe no verticality at all. Because I saw that the tower, I think there is a dichotomic pair. The tower, what complements the tower? Probably the cave, the cave and the tower. So maybe, and also significantly while, um, and sorry for this digression, but it is somehow related to, to, to what we are going to talk uh, even uh, in this presentation. Uh, if you think about it, the Chicago Tribune was built for a news, news, newspaper. It was a tower for a newspaper, just as it was the Times Tower in New York City, also for a newspaper, the New York Times. But today, the, the big forces in media built horizontal buildings like the apple uh, you know the the apple uh, headquarters the facebook book uh, headquarters and the google uh, headquarters they don't have towers but they extend it horizontally a lot anyway sorry about this let's look at the museum by um, by uh, uh, holine hans holine uh, the interior is as it is. I think the interior has elements of what we might call postmodernism, uh, even these steps on the round here. There is a little bit of, a, of a disputable uh, softness, but towards the outside, uh, even this industrial look uh, or in rhythm, I think, uh, makes it escape the, the being uh, doomed by uh, what we call postmodernism. It's a modern building. I wouldn't call it postmodern. Glass and ceramics house in Tehran, in Iran. Yes, Iran has this house by Hans Holland, 1978. Uh, 1978. Um, I also, um, I was told today by Natalia, one of the two Natalias who are here today uh, told me that um, Indeed, in Budapest, uh, Grimshaw uh, won the competition for a subway station, a railway station in, in Buda Budapest. Truly, uh, the, uh, even our neighbors are investing in good architecture coming from other, other architects. So I wonder why Romania is not doing something like this, you know, because the money is, is here. I don't think Iran was much richer than us or uh, Hungary uh, more than us. It's a different mentality. They are open. Well, Iran is not. But even Iran, you know, look, in 1978, 1978, well, is this building which is old, but the inside was um, refurbished by him. This is, yeah, you could say it's, it's postmodern. And he tried to echo, you know, certain things from the, the Iranian culture, I guess. Um, not everything he did, in my opinion, is truly great. Uh, maybe when he allowed the designer to take over the architect, maybe he's a little uh, problematic, but he's always interesting. Hans Hollein is always interesting. It's theatrical, it's rhetorical, it's provocative, it's idiosyncratic. Um, so he makes a statement, he makes a splash, Hans Hollein. Now, this is a school in Vienna, 1979, 1990. You have to understand this was the time when postmodernism was um, ruling the world. And uh, that was very unfortunate because even Kenzo, uh, Ken Gokuma uh, collapsed. Uh, not that he succumbed, he actually collapsed when he designed a horrible, horrible, horrible showroom for, the, for Mazda. Uh, Maybe you know it. In my moments of despair and uh, discouragement and uh, maliciousness, I, I even wrote about this. I said, I'm surprised the Japanese didn't uh, remove his right to build after he built that thing. I'm talking about Ken Gokuma. This is a sketch for, uh, for, this, uh, for this building is here. It's the school by Hans Holland. Well, uh, you know, uh, quite a school, especially if you look at this uh, part uh, in, the, in the courtyard. 
uh, yeah, this I would say is um, has elements of uh, you know uh, what we call postmodernism. But the intentions are still good with a courtyard, with a tree in the center, uh, which I hope uh, grew uh, since uh, the picture was taken. Shoeless. The schools. The ping pong table. The picnic table. <laughs> I mean, both tables are very uh, appealing to me. Again, formal capriciousness. Yesterday, I found out that the director, uh, an art historian actually, who founded uh, from scratch, it's from nothing, uh, the Skyscraper Museum in New York, she published a book called Form Follows Finance. We usually say form follows function. She wrote form follows uh, finance, meaning money. Uh, but there are many permutations between, um, well, between form and something else, or function and something else. Like Bernard Chumi said, the form follows fiction, meaning function is fiction. Uh, Louis Kahn said form evokes uh, function. Uh, and uh, in a cynical uh, mood, I wrote somewhere that function follows form. But, you know, uh, the relationship between function and form is uh, always uh, complex, but there is a relationship between them, yes. Now, an apartment, apartments in Berlin, uh, it was this very interesting uh, action that Berlin took in, you know, in the 80s, when just like they did in the 50s, and as they did in the 30s, they invited the most important architects or some of the most important architects in, in the world to build a building in Berlin, a residential building in Berlin. And Berlin did this three times. And now Berlin is, uh, is, uh, has a constellation of uh, very important buildings by very important architects built in three periods, in the 30s, in the 50s, and in the 80s. We could do something like this too, to invite architects from uh, you know, all over the world to build, um, let's say, social housing somewhere and create a colony of such buildings. Anyway, this is the building he, uh, he designed, the, the plan uh, of, of the building for Berlin, and you are going to see it. And again, if we look at this plan, we see him. I see his face somehow. You know, it's, 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 it's almost there, it's almost classical, it's almost straight, it's almost okay. But then there is, a, there is something a little bit twisted, a little bit disturbed or disturbing. And, uh, and this is, uh, I guess, this is what, uh, you know, the non-conventional, but then there is, I don't think there is a conventional artist or a conventional architect. I think a true architect or a true, uh, artist or a true writer or a true musician always disturbs a little bit, uh, you know, the status quo. It's it's in the nature of being creative, being a, a, at least a little bit rebellious, you know. And and he was, you know, here. I mean, he could have very easily avoided this, uh, you know, because he didn't have to orient uh, this staircase towards Mecca or anything. No, no, it's, it's his spirit and they like it, you know, I mean, here you have the octagon, um, you know, the entrance hallway and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's logical, the apartment here you have in front of you, you know, the, the, the living room and then uh, two smaller rooms left, right, and here is the bathroom, they are connected, so you know, it almost passes the, the requirements of uh, Ernest Neufert. By the way, Ernest Neufert studied at the Bauhaus, if you can believe it. But there is even a more, a more unbelievable thing about Ernest Neufert, and that is that he loved Antoni Gaudi. Can you believe it? In fact, I feel like writing, or probably was, I imagine it was already written, a book about with this very title, Ernest Neufert and Antoni Gaudi, 
or the other way around, Anthony Gaudi and uh, Ernest Neufer, because they have nothing in common, absolutely nothing. I mean, can you imagine Gaudi, uh, you know, reading uh, the manual uh, of uh, Ernest Neufer? Or can you imagine Ernest Neufer uh, doing, uh, building uh, Sagrada Familia? Although uh, you can find interesting things by uh, Ernest Neufer, he built with his um, the son. This is the building by uh, Hans Holland in, in Berlin. I don't know. I mean, it is. This is. Yes, I would say it's. It's. We could. We, we could call it postmodern. Uh, he he was the victim of that time, and uh, I'm not trying to excuse him. But but there is still something interesting here. It's not. It's not as disturbing as postmodernism in general could be. No, it, it's discreetly still kind of discreetly postmodern. He's not afraid to take risks. You, you look at the, you know, the finishes of this part of the building uh, compared to, to what we see here. It's the same building. Uh, a purist, a dogmatic architect would never have something like this. But just like Peter Sir Peter Cook, he is playful. And I think this playfulness deserves attention. And uh, I think very often we are not playful because we restrict ourselves. We are afraid to be playful. It's true, when you are playful, you could also make mistakes. But mistakes sometimes are preferable to, you know, uh, correctness, which leads to total boredom. I think it's better to make mistakes, but be alive than to make no mistakes and be dead. Because only if you, when you are dead, you don't make mistakes. Now, this is the building that I refer to, uh, right in the Haas House in Vienna from 1985 to 1990, is right across the, the piazza, the square from uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral. Uh, I don't think it's one of his greatest buildings. It's a commercial building. He tried, maybe he tried too hard. You see his dualities here. You see the rather predictable uh, rhythmicity of these uh, squares. And then, you know, he, he, he tried to bring in the certain things together, to hold them together somehow. But um, I, I, I think it's not, it's not a great building. But, you know, it's right there. And he had the courage to bring, uh, you know, kind of an iconoclastic modernity in a in a in a square which is uh, you know uh, surrounded by uh, you know historical uh, structures culminating of course in the center with Saint Stephen's Cathedral. Here it is the cathedral. So we have commerce and we have God, if uh, if we if we can uh, so simplistically describe uh, describe everything. Lots of glass, of course, there, there were no concerns then in the 80s with uh, losing energy or paying the bills. They have the money there because not only is Vienna, but it's in the center of Vienna. And, uh, you know, uh, Vienna doesn't even need to work. It can live on tourism or at least um, uh, it, it was able to do so before the pandemic. I like these reflections, these distortions. Distortions are always uh, uh, pleasing. They are about the, the otherness of life, the otherness of, of, uh, of, um, of art, actually. So you see the typical buildings. Oh, by the way, not far away from here, although I didn't visit, it is the foundation Frederick Kiesler. Frederick Kiesler, born in Chisinau. And he lived in Bucharest, and I think he, he had a Romanian citizenship. I have the monograph on Fr Frederick Kiesler, uh, published by the Whitney Museum of Modern Art in New York, where it says Romanian architect living and working in, well, he did in Austria, France, and, and the United States. Strangely, no one talks in Romania about him, and he's without doubt the best known Romanian architect outside of Romania. I mean, he's adored, he's revered by many in the West, while we don't even talk about him. 
Uh, he didn't build a lot, it's true. He didn't even recognize he was Romanian. He said he was Austrian. He was not Austrian. Although, you know, the history at that time, it belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But I think he had Romanian citizenship. And uh, in fact, uh, a few years ago, I talked to the director of the um, Kistler Foundation in Vienna, and he told me that he wanted to export a big, uh, 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 big exhibition, uh, uh, retrospective Frederick Kistler to Bucharest. Why? Well, because Kistler was, uh, was Romanian in the sense that uh, he, I think he was a Romanian citizen. He left Bucharest when he was 28 or so. So he was not like Yanis Xenakis, nine years old when he left uh, Braila. Anyway, it's not, it's not about patriotism here, but I still think we should know, you know, since there aren't too many people born around here, you know, who made a splash in the West. And uh, Frederick Kistler did make a splash and, uh, you know, he was honored uh, significantly. You can imagine he has a foundation in Vienna and they, it's very close to the cathedral. I don't know exactly where because I didn't visit it to my shame, but uh, it's maybe even in the shadow of these spires of the St. Stephen's Cathedral. Bravo to Frederick Kistler. Now, Museum für die Moderne Kunst uh, in Frankfurt am Main, 1987-1991. Here it is. Uh, yes, it has some uh, postmodern elements, but it has also the vigor of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, triangular uh, site advancing uh, at the intersection of some major uh, highways or streets. It has force, I would say. And it stands out in comparison with the buildings left and right. It does. Uh, he, he, he's, he's a hybrid architect. His architecture, I mean, look, uh, look at this window here, this bow window here, or uh, you know, these uh, receding things, step things, you know, which make you think of Carlos Scarpa. Uh, maybe he was an architect, I don't know. I, I'm not really an expert in uh, Hans Hollein, but it's possible he had, uh, you know, inspirations or influences coming from various places. Um, yes, I, I would describe his architecture as being uh, hybrid in a way, impure if this uh, world would not alarm uh, the, the, the purist. I think life itself is impure. And, uh, you know, that impurity could be a, a source of richness or uh, it depends how you look at it. So this is in Frankfurt am Main in Germany, a museum by Hans Hollein. I think the interior is a little bit, for my taste, it's not visceral enough, but uh, maybe considering the function, you know, usually museums are like this because we bring in the art and the art is supposed to be the, the spectacle, the, the difference, la différence. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I think Louis Kahn, for example, at the Kimball Museum in Texas, uh, integrated very well art with the building. So the building, even if you remove the art, uh, still had a, a, a worm, so it was not like this. Here, if you remove the art, you just get white walls and, uh, you know, everything becomes all of a sudden rather, you know, aseptic. Now, the, this could have been a beautiful work. Unfortunately, it was not built in Salzburg. Uh, Guggenheim, the museum in uh, Mönchsberg in Salzburg, Austria, uh, a great project underground. Um, I, I, I love the, the sketches and the model. Uh, it could have been a very interesting building, but many, many times, unfortunately, great buildings are not being built. I hope, uh, yeah, look, look, look at this section, you know, it's, it's maddening in a way, you know, because again, it's about the otherness of art. And uh, it's, it's um, I, I wrote an essay, actually I attended a, a lecture by Hans Hollein at Columbia University in New York many years ago, of course he was alive. 
I'm not sure I was alive, but I was there in the auditorium. And after the kids lecture, I wrote, a, 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 let's call it an essay, something. I wrote something called Apropos of Hans Holland's lecture. If anyone here wants to read it, I could send it to you. Uh, and I, I, at that time I was in a very negative mode. Uh, maybe not only at that time, but at that time I was drastically negative. And I remember I, 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 I accused him as uh, not being quite a serious architect. And if we look at this section, at this curved, you know, uh, thing, uh, you know, penetrating the earth, you know, I think not too many architects would make it like this curved in this way, you know, maybe, you know, it would have been so more natural. I mean, it's unnatural as it is because it's deeply, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, 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 that the, the, the penetration of the earth is deep, but why is it like this? Uh, curved. If you look at the plan, it's a different spirit, and I like very much the plan because it's labyrinthical. It's uh, it has a certain uh, geometrical viscerality, but the section the section is shows uh, the idiosyncratic aspects of Hans Holland, and uh, this drawing uh, it's it's very much him. I, I I like it. I mean, it's 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 sensitive. It's a good drawing. But uh, it, it shows that he was, in my opinion, Hans Hollein was a troubled man. But I, I mean, of course, he's not the only one. Most of us are troubled. Some know it, some don't. But we are all troubled, actually. Why, why, why am I saying most? We are all troubled. Maybe the most troubled are those who think they are not troubled. And look at these sections. <laughs> You know, it's some kind of a you know dark utopia, or I don't, I wouldn't call it a dystopia because it's a museum. But um, I, don't know, I, I like them very much. But uh, anyway, it was not built. Look, he anticipated the cave, the cave revival of the present. I mean, truly, this kind of architecture uh, is very fashionable now. And he anticipated it, you know, uh, 40 years ago. So this man was uh, visionary as well. Maybe himself doubted that side of him, but uh, he was. Another museum, St. Pölden in Austria, 1992, a big one, 1992, uh, 2002. So uh, the construction was uh, finalized 20 years uh, from us. Uh, 20 years ago, and it's a good building. A good building with a variety of things going on here. And look at the sketch. Uh, what is this turbulence here? Again, the rationalists would protest. What is this nonsense here? Well, it's the nervousness of the architect, sir. That's what it is. The architect is not supposed to be nervous sometimes at least. Uh, okay, maybe that nervousness was only half uh, serious, <clears throat> but uh, interesting things here. <clears throat> what is less interesting is, although it does, but no, I better not comment on this. It's, it's rather ominous, no? Uh, uh, similar scenes I have seen in the, the, the Musée de Confluence, built by his uh, countryman, uh, Wolf Prix. Um, also from Vienna, of course, but built in Lyon. Uh, and I thought in the case of Le Musée de Confluence was a commentary on, uh, on uh, you know, in a way the, the, the tragic uh, output of uh, or consequences sometimes of, of this assault on nature, animals and plants alike. Uh, being done uh, often with the participation of what we call science. What we see here is something else. This, this museum uh, is uh, both, uh, you know, you saw what does this have to do with this? It's the same, it's, it's like a hybrid function of, uh, you know, it's less, uh, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's a museum which is not just about art, which is also an interesting idea, I think, to bring in various functions. Uh, 
Hans Holai, Hans Holai. Now this thing, it, for my taste, is a little bit forced here, you know, yes, it's, it's uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's supposed to appear dramatic, but uh, I think it's rather in a decorative way dramatic, but maybe not, maybe, maybe if I visited it, I, I would have had a different opinion, it's possible, but we see the playfulness of the architect, the the capriciousness of the architect the yeah the, the playfulness is important i still have some doubts about this surface here i guess he wanted something to compensate for to balance the rigidity of these volumes here and uh, we see his dualities right here in this in this museum I don't think he was too idealistic about the life. Um, I, I, I think he had a certain, uh, maybe even bitterness, I think. I don't know. Anyway, uh, a tower in Vienna, 1994-2000. Strangely, I have been in Vienna several times and uh, I, I never, when I passed by this building, I never thought it was by him. But it was, and, uh, and it is. And you look here again, it's the same man. You remember that uh, art gallery in New York, an early work where he created that uh, uh, asymmetrical uh, opening into the facade uh, with, with, with some, some, some suggestions of, uh, of symmetry as well. Here, this is forced in a way, but it's a commentary, you know, maybe even a little bit ironical. A commentary on the, in a way, on on the, the ephemerality of uh, even the most, uh, you know, uh, full of certitudes towers. So this problematizes the tower. The tower uh, here in the corner becomes, uh, you know, less sure of itself. And I guess that's perhaps what he wanted to to evoke. You know, again, it's about disruption. It's about, uh, uh, you know, um, being uh, less complacent and wanting to, to belong to the other side as well simultaneously. The Austrian embassy in Berlin, 1996-2001. I don't know. I mean, yes, sure. But um, yeah, it looks a little bit populist. Uh, I'm glad he uses colors, but um, yeah, in this work, I would say he, he proves himself to be, to an extent at least, a postmodern. At that time, James Sterling also uh, worked in Berlin and built an embassy and so on, and they were affected, it's true. Uh, almost everybody was... Uh, was, uh, you know, almost ravished, I would say, by postmodernism. But it's possible that, uh, you know, people in the future would look less critically towards postmodernism. I don't know. I, I, uh, this is an interbank headquarters for, uh, um, I mean, a bank for, uh, I mean, a bank in Peru, in Lima, uh, you know, a commercial structure with big letters interbank, uh, a proud uh, skyscraper, but it's not uh, it's not uh, uninteresting, uh, you know, uh, sculpturally or architecturally. It's, it's still uh, rather unique. I don't like banks in general <laughs> because I don't like the business. I don't like money, and money doesn't like me. So that's why allow me to go rather quickly through this uh, work in, in Lima by. Um, by Hans Hollein. Centrum Bank in uh, Liechtenstein, 1997-2002. Uh, Again, banks. That's where the money is. What can we do? Uh, but he, because we know by now, uh, you know, these uh, architectonic uh, subtleties, he tried to sabotage a little bit, uh, you know, the, that, that feeling that a uh, bank is always righteous and, uh, you know, straight and so on. 
You see, the building is not straight. I think he was a master of perverse architecture. Uh, and perversity is, of course, uh, morally speaking, uh, uh, questionable, but, um, you know, sometimes at least, uh, if they are not pushed too far, they could uh, bring some, uh, you know, uh, spices to uh, aesthetics, if we are to talk just about aesthetics. It's, 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 a, it's an interesting building, if we look more at it, actually. Hans Holai. Vulcania, European Center of Vulcanology in Auvergne, France. I, I like this picture, and uh, that's why I, 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 I placed it on the, on the, on the, the invitation for today. I, I like this fact that his architecture is hybrid, is, um, has a level of complexity, you know, the, uh, there is a variety of, uh, of uh, spaces and volumes and uh, he's not afraid to take risks. I also like the fact that a building almost becomes, um, you know, a little town or a, a larger settlement. It's not just a building, it's not an object. I mean, it, he, he has a sum of objects, but the, the, the relationship between these objects creates a richer uh, whole. And this whole has, uh, you know, it's an org org organism. It's an organism which is, which is not just a simple sum of uh, dead objects. This aspect I think is worth uh, uh, underlining as being positive. That is, there is this uh, urban quality or public quality, even in, you know, uh, private uh, private parts. Even considering private parts of his uh, of his buildings. I mean, it makes one think of, let's say, a medieval town or a medieval city where you have, in time, you know. Uh, uh, um, um, an accumulation of, of various kinds of uh, buildings, usually built uh, over a, you know, a longer period of time. He was able somehow to do this, although he built this building at once, so to speak. In uh, Let's see how many years he built this. Well, five years. But, but many things are going on here. So this is in France. And uh, it seems to... Re to properly relate him to the name and the function of the building. Vulcanology. Hans Holai. There is also Eros here, of course. I think uh, good art and good architecture cannot uh, completely turn their backs on the very source of life. And eros often is a result of conflict. I mean, we talk about love, but um, love uh, often uh, is, uh, you know, uh, simultaneously present uh, with uh, what we call conflict. It's, it's, it's both. It's love and war, eros and thanatos. He's always surprising. I mean, yes, and this this is this is a beautiful work. It's not a major work. He just did a you you'll see a, a canopy, but everybody in Vienna knows it, and even those who are just uh, tourists, you cannot pass by without noticing it. The Albertina, a great museum, the Albertina Museum extension, 2001, 2003. Look what he did. You know, again, he, he, you you say. You know, what is that? You know, why did he do it like this? You know, I, I again, I think this represents, symbolizes the otherness of art. And look at it. You know, it's, it's a resolute gesture that, that tells you you have to stop. You have to pay attention. This is a museum. This is an art museum. And art is about 
to tell you something that you refuse to acknowledge even when you look in the mirror. This is what art is supposed to do, to show the otherness of, uh, of life, of oneself and so on. And sometimes it is a protest, sometimes it is an enigmatic smile like on the face of Mona Lisa. This is the role of art and that's why we need art. And, and this, you know, uh, canopy, which is clearly, I mean, he, he didn't have a specific reason to, 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 to make it in this way. Again, the functional is to totally protest, you know, but, but I think Hans Hollein was right. This thing is saying, pay attention to art. We are different. We artists are different. And that's our main force. Uh, you know, the interior is the interior. What can we say? It's fine. It's fine. But I like the, I like the black canopy. An office building in Vienna, Austria, developed. Uh, well, he, he obviously liked, liked uh, very much because I saw it also in an earlier work, a smaller version, not like in the, uh, the Albertina. But they all represent the same thing. This, this canopy is the otherness the otherness of the artist, the otherness of the rebellious architect, the otherness uh, that sometimes is appreciated by, uh, by uh, committees and you get the Pritzker Prize. Uh, although I can't see too much of the otherness of Francis Kerr. By the way, his birthday will, uh, will, uh, will pop up in a few days and I am going to dedicate a presentation to him. I, I, I try to be as objective as possible, and I will talk about him with as much affection I, I can find. For the moment, I'm still reticent, no reticent, rather critical of him, but we'll see maybe by, uh, the, I think the 9th of, uh, 9th of uh, April is his birthday. I forgot, but it is in April. Francis Kerr, I would welcome him. Uh, Simio, God, Taiwan apartment buildings. Look at them. You know, they are Hans Holland. They, they are, you know, regular towers, but then with uh, something different here at the top, of course, the coiffure of the building is where, you know, one uh, is becoming more uh, fanciful. Taiwan apartment buildings, Hans Holland. Not everything is uh, wow. No, Lima again. How come Peru, you know, invited our neighbor Hans Hollein to build there? Romanian could have invited Hans Hollein. It is much closer, no? But it didn't even cross our mind. Not that he is necessarily, you know, the greatest architect ever, but still, you know, you wonder why is it that Peru found the interest in Hans Hollein? and not Romania. Why? Because Peru is not richer than Romania. It's not. So it's not a question of money. It's a question of uh, something else, being curious, being open. Look, now uh, Lima has uh, another building by, uh, by Hans Hollein. Uh, they also have a bank by him, and uh, maybe it's not so little. 